Hello, and welcome to Tohomaru Cemetery. We're having a special program today in honor of St. Patrick's Day. And uh, we have with us Sarah Miller of Florida Public Archaeology Network, who not only knows everything about the cemetery now, but um, has also been to Ireland recently, and will have some interesting things to tell us about there. After, the, after Sarah's talk is over, we're going to have special Irish-focused tours. If you walk around, you notice that there are Irish flags and little shamrocks out there. Those mark the marked Irish burials. I mean, there are many more people, Irish, Menorcan, and all sorts of things here, whose graves are not marked. There's about a thousand people buried here, and there's only a hundred some markers. So, uh, however, we don't know where they are. But we will talk about one whose burial place is unknown and who is very important. So, after the wonderful talk, then uh, you are welcome to some wonderful tours by our great docents. So, join us, and here is Sarah Miller. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, slancha. Um, wonderful to see you all today. And I'll try and yell as loud as I can, but I know I probably only have a certain amount of radius anyway. Uh, my name is Sarah Miller. Thank you for the introduction, Elizabeth. And I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today because it's Florida Archaeology Month. And what we are focused on this year um, for this month in celebration is connecting to collections where can you go to see some of the artifacts that are owned by the state, that are on loan in different places around the town? So I brought some free Florida Public Ar uh, Florida Archaeology Month posters there, and you're welcome to take some. I also brought you, I'll show you at the end, some maps where you can go and see some of the collections that are on display, um, even relating to the topic of today. Uh, this is a modified presentation from a talk I gave at, it sounds very important, it's the uh, International Irish Diaspora Congress. I was one of the delegates from Florida, and I wanted to step back a second and just talk about diaspora, because it had been a new turn to me in my 20s, and sometimes when I'm giving the talk, it's a new term to others. So I'm just wondering if anyone from the audience can think of another culture that we've recognize and celebrate diaspora from different places around the world, not just Ireland. Any other? What is diaspora? Immigrants from the home country. Immigrants from the home country. And thank you, Brendan. This is the second time I've seen Brendan today because we do yoga on Saturday mornings together. Uh, so it's it's the a culture that spreads across the world into different places but still has some connections to the homeland. Uh, archaeologists are really thrilled to research diaspora because we get to learn a little bit about the home country but we also get to learn about how culture changes and adapts when it goes into new environments such as the Spanish leaving Spain and that environment and that architecture and that uh, the way they met their basic needs there and came here to Florida like on the moon, right? The um, environment, the uh, animals, the way they met their basic needs changed a lot on that day. And similar for the Irish who have spread all over the world. Uh, I usually start with a little warm up of how many people claim Irish descendancy in Florida. It's like million, like six million claim to be Irish descendants here in Florida. So uh, we certainly have good representation of the immigrants who have come to Florida, but I want to talk a little bit about some of the first who came to Florida. Some sites you can go to learn more about the early Irish in Florida. And then at the end, as Elizabeth said, I'm going to talk to you about places in Ireland. I encourage you to go because uh, I don't know if they are doing their best on the diaspora research exchange. There's a lot of things about us they don't know. And when we go to their sites and can inform them, hey, this is where the people end up. And we know this because we have evidence of them here in Florida. So you'll see a little example of what I mean uh, at the end of the talk. So the reasons we were there for the Congress and the reason I'm holding this first visual display up is I was really curious about markers for archaeologists uh, studying cultures through the objects they leave behind. I was curious, what would we find out about artifacts that are particularly Irish? 
we don't really have things like these. These are from my friend Joe Bagley, who's a city archaeologist in Boston, and they date to a little later time than our first Irish came here to St. Augustine, so that could be partly why. It would be nice to find something as uh, glorious as a shamrock on an artifact, um, but we just don't have too many specific artifacts we can point at and say this is definitely belongs to this person who was Irish back in this and so day. But one of the big aha moments of the conference was just a larger thinking about Irish landscapes, especially um, Irish farming methods that extend around the world and also down in Australia. They're doing a lot of research on these different kind of landscapes. So that's part of why I was there. I wanted to raise awareness of Irish heritage in Florida, encourage new research and interpretation of Irish sites in Florida, and increase heritage tourism to authentic sites. So uh, if you're new to Florida history today, I'm just going to review real quick the different historic time periods because there are Irish components to all the time periods in Florida, except perhaps the prehistoric time. But with the first Spanish period started in 1565 to 1763, the first uh, permanent settlement, we're here now in St. Augustine uh, in 1565, and also we'll be throwing back to Pensacola um, information throughout the talk and some of the Irish components in the history there. During the British period, there's British loyalists, including natives of Ireland, take refuge in British Florida during the American Revolution. Spanish capture West Florida with the help of the Hibernia Regiment. We'll hear a little bit more about them and one of their famous soldiers here. Um, the second Spanish period is 1784 to 1821. Spain regains Florida. Irish natives appointed to the first governor of West Florida and many Irish serve as priests in the Catholic Church Many Irish moved to Florida as um, refugees during the American Revolution and remain uh, uh, for lasting communities in East Florida as well. And then 1821, Spain cedes Florida to the U.S. and Irish figure prominently in the American period, and we see evidence for that in a lot of monuments and cemeteries. So to just focus in a little bit on St. Augustine, it was a surprise to those in Dublin that our town dates back to 1565. It was a surprise to many that Sir Francis Drake had come and ransacked our town in 1586. Uh, they were not aware of our archaeology ordinance. It goes back 25 years. So Carl Halbert had investigated over 800 sites. So if we don't know the answer to some of the questions that came up during the conference, at least we have the preservation of the material to go back and take a look if we were to find out about some marker or some dietary pattern or something else. We may not know what those patterns are now, but we have the resources because of the preservation of the artifacts and the material recovered. Um, and they definitely were not aware, many, many thought that um, Irish roots go back in Florida as far as the 18th century, but they really didn't know it extends as far back as the 16th century. So enter Ricardo Arturo, also known as Richard Arthur. I see some nice shaking heads. He's a native of Limerick, and he's first recorded immigrant to arrive in today's continental United States. So we are very proud that he uh, came here by way of the Irish Brigade and then served as priest studies in Spain. He comes to St. Augustine in 1597, and he dies in 1606. So my question I like to ask, where is he buried? I'd, li I'd like to think he's right here. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know, we don't know. But I have some wild speculations I'll share. Um, probably our second favorite Irishman, Father O'Reilly, and he dates quite a bit further in time to 1784 to 1812. You can go visit his house today. He was born in County Langford in 1752. He arrived here in 1779. Uh, it, he came by way of Bethana, and he was delayed due to the American Revolutionary War. So he was a pastor and vicar here in East Florida uh, in 1797, and then he died. And where's he buried? 
He's here! <laughs> Um, but I do encourage you to go to the Father O'Reilly House. It's a beautiful site to go visit. It is free and open to the public. We have some maps uh, that will direct you there. There, you can see these collections I'm talking about, some of the artifacts that were recovered by Dr. Kathy Vegan. She was studying um, the domestic site there. I asked her, so, Kathy, you have some Irish markers I could go and show people in Ireland? And she said, yeah, maybe, maybe not. So um, there, we're still looking at some of the patterns of what could be considered and point to directly as Irish, because in a way it resembled a lot of other uh, deposits found in St. Augustine at the time. But do go check out the artifacts that are on display there. How many of you have been to Fleming Island? Oh, who? All right, Nick, well done. Uh, Fleming Island used to go by the name of Hibernia. And I don't know if you recognize the name Hibernia, but it's an old ancient term for Ireland. So Hibernia has Hibernia town, Hibernian settlement, and it's now called Fleming Island after the Irish immigrant family who settled there. George Fleming, for whom Fleming Island's name, he's from County Meath, and he gets a land grant for Hibernia in Florida in 1790. So he moves to the area, but uh, he was one of the wild geese, and there's a great poem by Red Hair Kipling that helped illustrate to me what the wild geese were about. Old days, the wild geese are flighting, head to the storm as they faced it before. For where there are Irish, there's bound to be fighting, and when there's no fighting, it's Ireland no more. Ireland no more. Uh, and that opens the chapter on George and George Fleming that is from um, Margaret Seton Fleming Biddle's book about Hibernia, the unchanging tide about the founding of Fleming Island in Clay County. We went to Clay County to see what evidence there is still. Are there Irish markers? Are there Irish landscapes? And there is a wonderful cemetery called Hibernia or St. Catherine's, St. Margaret's, St. Margaret's. Uh, we've done a crypt workshop there recently. But when I went to the county archives, she said, yeah, no, nothing directly. Oh, well, there's this. And she showed me, this is Vichy Gehrig, the county archivist. She showed me all these beautiful volumes of bootlegging that tie back. And sure enough, you look at the family, the founding family's name. But as an archaeologist, what I was particularly interested in, when they did the documentation of the bootlegging, they would confiscate artifacts. They would confiscate materials related to uh, the moonshine production. So they were able to take um, glass vessels, ceramics, they took uh, cars, they took uh, boats, they took anything related to bootlegging, which is a little similar to some of our archaeology laws today, that you can take people's computers, you can take their cars, etc., if they're breaking the law. Um, those records have not been digitized, so I think it's a really good future project for a student to go and digitize those records and we can find out a little bit more about the material culture of the bootlegging culture there. I wanted to just mention some of what's going on in Pensacola because they have interesting parallel to what's happening in St. Augustine around that time. And Pensacola, the Luna shipwrecks date to 1559, so there's a failed settlement to remind them of that, but it is inspiring nonetheless that uh, the settlement was there so early. The Presidio Santa Maria de Cave is founded in 1698, and then uh, other presidios follow after that in that location uh, up to the second Spanish. But for our discussion on the Irish, um, Lieutenant Governor of West Florida, Montford Brown, he brings 200 Irish uh, indentured servants to his land grant in West Florida, and he leaves them there to their own devices. So there is a significant uh, settlement of Irish over in West Florida. Um, Galvez also captures Pensacola from the British in 1781, and he does this with the help of the Hibernian Regiment. And um, Richard Arthur, Arturo O'Neill, is the first Spanish governor of West Florida and is also Irish. Uh, there are several monuments to the Irish in Pensacola and also up to the uh, 
uh, American Civil War, a lot of artifacts that do indicate the Irish that were present over there. Anyone recognize this site? That tasted dirt here, I think. <laughs> Uh, these are the burials that were found after Hurricane Matthew damage was assessed on King Street. So these burials, we were very excited to find them, Carl Halbert and many of the SAAA volunteers here today. They are some of the earliest burials we have of settlers in the downtown area in the late 16th century. So after the settlement moved back, to this area of town in the 1570s and dates up through um, the late 16th, early 17th century. So my question is, given the time period of the Nuestra Señora de los Remedios, could he be buried there? And it's quite likely, in talking to Carl, that he may have been buried there. I'll ask Elizabeth, what do you think? It's, 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 thumbs up, really thumbs possible. Down. It's really so when I delivered this news at the conference in Dublin, I didn't realize, but the woman I was so inspired by who had given the Irish landscape paper in Australia was Susan Arthur. I was like, wait a minute, from Limerick? My family's from Limerick. And her sister is a mad genealogist, and she has the records that go back to the time of Richard Arthur. So they're ready. They're like, got their veins ready. They're excited <laughs> to give DNA. And then talking Great. with um, yeah. Dr. Craig Baum, who's doing the DNA analysis of the uh, burials, is just not very likely. I think very few of the ear bones that are required to do the DNA matching exist, and it could be from a range of individuals. There were some men, women, children, those from Africa, from a diversity of different places around the world. So could it be someday we can find the burial of Richard Arthur? It's possible. It's possible. Uh, and you can still walk by the site, but I think there's nothing to see of it there. Do go walk down Avalays where you can see the post holes from where the church used to be that are in brass markers down embedded in the ground. Historic cemeteries, and yay all you for getting out here today because cemeteries are indeed one of the few places where you can point and indicate and say, early Irish were here, here is the evidence of them. And one of my favorite other, I mean, I have a second favorite cemetery. And St. Monica is in Palatka. Talmado is my first, well, I guess Huguenot's my second, so third favorite cemetery. This is in Palatka, so it's not in town here. It's about 45 miles west. And this is a headstone. Robbie and I were doing an event in Palatka, and this woman walked up and she said, have you seen this headstone? It's got Polish on it or Gaelic or something. So we dropped everything we were doing and ran over to St. Monica's to find it. And it's a Gaelic headstone. And it's of Eliza O'Driscoll from Limerick County also. And um, there's a translation of what is written on the grave. So I wonder, it's a very unique kind of burial. On top of having the Gaelic written up here, there's these cobbled together stones. When we were in Hibernia Cemetery in Fleming Island, we saw a similar cobbling of granite stones at the bottom, which is not from around here. Those rocks are not made in Florida. How did they get pieced together? I had a theory maybe this was an Irish marker. I would go to Ireland and find cemeteries full of these granite cobbled bases. That did not turn out to be true, unfortunately. It was a better story before I went over and verified, no, uh, that's not really happening. So review, you can go to Pensacola, you can go down King Street and other ways. You can go to Palatka, you could go to Palatka, go to Clay County, to Green Coast Springs, have some whiskey there. Uh, you could go and talk to the guys at the St. Augustine Lighthouse. As I mentioned, some Irish came with the British Loyalists, and as they've been excavating the storm wreck, we know there are connections to Scotland that have been found on the wreck. And, um, England, but I wonder if there could be some evidence for Irish on the wreck that they've been excavating. Now on to Ireland. I was there a few days early and a few days late, and I just wanted to point out some of the sites that I was really impressed by as a Florid Floridian archaeologist, but also felt compelled to let them know we have some similar kinds of things, except this thing. Anybody been to Newgrange? Brendan, you there, my new friend? Good to meet you. 
Um, New Grange is a 5,000 year old Neolithic passage tomb. I don't think we have anything like it that we know of, especially built this substantially out of rocks. We do have some burial mounds and we do have evidence for uh, archaeoastronomy about sites that are aligned due to stars, to solar events, to lunar events. And New Grange, it's on the winter solstice that you can stand there and a path, a pathway is lit. The sun goes through this lintel box on top and lights the way up through the center of the passage. There's a lottery you can win. And if it sounds incredible that you could be one of the ones selected, just know the trick works for like three days around the solstice. So they do have the lottery for that many days. So I will pass that around. This is one of the World Heritage Sites. Um, I really wish we could get a World Heritage Site for St. Augustine. I saw Jamestown failed in their World Heritage Site application, so we could still get it. We could yeah. still get um, one for St. Augustine, but it's really a remarkable site to go see. I think one of the closest archaeological sites that's on the World Heritage, um, that's recognized as a World Heritage Site, is Poverty Point in Louisiana, and that dates um, around the same time and is a series of mounds and large landscape features, but they certainly do not have the interpretive dollars that New Grange developed. So if you go, it's just like an hour outside of Dublin, an easy trip, uh, lots of buses, lots of tour groups go out there. Uh, near there is the Hills of Tara, that's also in County Meath. And um, it's an impressive place to go, and I'll pass around some of the pictures to it. But when we were on that, uh, when I had read Meredith Seton Biddle's book on Fleming Island, and they traced their ancestors back to the kings of Meath. So this is where the kings of Meath were crowned, or on the hills of Terra. I'm like, oh my god, it's all coming full circle back to Florida. So a, a bit of a Florida stretch, but connection there. They also have very impressive historic cemeteries, and one is Glasnevin Cemetery. 1.5 million burials. So you could probably start a tour on January 1st, and maybe if you worked as a team, finish <laughs> all the headstones that are Irish uh, by the end of Christmas time. But it opened in 1832. It's got a lovely little museum. Michael Connolly's buried there. And if you want, you can go to the Grave Digger pub and have a pint but bring cash because they often lose electricity. So don't want to depend on your card for that. They do have, you'll notice in the picture, these nice markers that will say what has been worked on by their preservation team. And you know that your preservation dollars are going to good work because you can see the little, little labels that are around there. I just added the Guinness storehouse because we have Guinness, right? The <laughs> Florida connection. But it is the most visited site in <laughs> Ireland, and their interpretation is very powerful. They've done a very good job being very immersive when you go through the different floors, um, and they've paid attention to sights and sounds and tastes and smells and tactile things. So when you go, it's a, it's a real uh, inspiration as far as how to interpret the history of something as humble as beer for all the millions that come through there. <sighs> bog bodies. I had heard so much about the Irish bog bodies and I went <laughs> over to the National Museum of Ireland to check out their bog bodies exhibit. And I spent a bit of time in there. They have really well done interpretation. It'll show you the portions of the burial that they have artifacts that were found with it, any other information about it, and they're behind a hidden alcove. So if anybody wants to visit them but not see the remains, they respect that too because um, uh, for many cultures it's taboo or it may not be respectful in the eyes of all to go see the remains. So I think they did a really good job with that. Here's some of the reconstruction. As I was walking around with the docent, he said, oh, do you have questions? Beware the docent that asked me if I have questions. I had a billion and five, and when we got through them, I said, well, you know about uh, Florida's bog bodies, right? What? Yeah, we have bog bodies. Our, our window or mortuary burial pond, uh, 
uh, in Brevard County near Coco, where they found about 200 individuals. They did not fully excavate the pond, so we don't know how many people were buried there. We have excellent organic preservation, just as they do with the bog bodies, and it's a anaerobic environment, very tannic, like the bogs as well. It's not quite the same as a bog, the way the lakes are done, but we do have more of these kinds of lakes in Florida. And I wish I could go back. Let's all go back and I'll tell him the update that we have another mortuary pond that's been found in Florida in the last year, Minnesota Key. I'd say let's all go there, but you can't visit this one on land. You have to get up your dive gear and dive into the Gulf. It's near Naples and it is being currently excavated by the Division of Historical Resource in consultation with the Seminole tribe. So we're going to find out a lot more information about that kind of burial site. But I think that's something that um, the Irish were totally unaware of and the docents, and they did grab a few over to come in here about the bog bodies of Florida. This one I just threw in because our cousins at the Huguenot Cemetery are open today too, I understand. And they have a Huguenot Cemetery in Dublin. I don't know much about it besides what was on the historic marker, so you can take a look. But there's dates to 1693. Uh, and Slane Castle. Oh, I didn't, did I not pass that one? Well, enjoy that one. It's a little late. But. Uh, and then just to bring the talk full circle, when we went by Slane Castle, some of you from the 80s will appreciate this is where you two wrote The Unforgettable Fire. They were put up in the castle to write their masterpiece. But this used to be the land of the Flemings, of the, um, the uh, well it says in here, the Baron of Slane. So the aristocracy that ruled there and left, and the Flemings that came here to Fleming Island. So I'm on the tour, we're going by the Slane Castle, and they said, yeah, send the Baron of Slane and his descendants, and they up and left, and we don't know where they went. <laughs> <laughs> I know this one, they went to Fleming Island, and you can go and visit their burials at the Hibernia Cemetery at St. Margaret's. So just a reminder that diaspora is about studying the cultures as they expanded out, how they adapted, how they changed, but there's also an obligation to go back to the home cultures to remind them where their descendants went, how they survived. They are proud of them too, but Florida is really a missing chapter for them. They now have a national museum on Irish di diaspora experience called EPIC, and you go there, it's overwhelming, beautiful 20 rooms of all this information and data. They do go back as far as the wild geese and the Hibernian Regiment, but they do not know about the 17th and 16th century uh, legacies that they left here in Florida and in North America in general. So it's our job. Now we'll all work together to go back to Ireland <laughs> and let them know <laughs> um, and, uh, and continue to celebrate. We had a couple years ago the we all, some of us served as honor guard for Carl Halbert in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and I, I would be fired if I didn't point out that we have the oldest recording of a St. Patrick's Day Parade in our documents, a, a festival for San Patricio, and there was some walking around uh, of the fort. <laughs> we count it, we count it, we claim it for historical documentation, and that's back to, I think, 1601. Yeah. Michael Francis. Michael Francis is continuing to do his archival work, so we might continue to find more about the early Irish here in Florida and about the um, legacy of other cultures that came here to Florida so long ago. But do pick up an Archaeology Month poster. It's about collections and the prehistoric collections that have been returned, particularly uh, the Kimanko Cat down in southwest Florida. And there are maps, you're free to take them, or they are on our website, so if you don't want to carry the paper around, we can direct you to that URL of places to explore in downtown St. Augustine. These are ones you can drive to, but on the other side are ones you can walk to, including Father O'Reilly House. Well, thank you very much, and now you're going to get the best treat of the day, a walking tour.
Well, thank you very much, Sarah. That was wonderful. We really, really enjoyed it. And it is interesting that you're going back to where the diaspora people originated from, and, you know, regardless of the particular diaspora, just to see if, they, if they're aware of this. I know that the Tolomano Indians, for example, from here are in Cuba now. Their descendants are in Cuba. And I would bet they don't have a lot of connection with, with this. So someday, that's, that's just like a moral obligation for us yes, to go there. Yes, we should. We should. <laughs> Thank you so much. That Thank was really, you. really fascinating. So-